In March 1947, I came back to India. Less than a year after leaving the East, which meant so much to me, I was back again, back in the highest position an Englishman could hold, Viceroy of India. It should have been the most marvelous moment, and in some ways indeed it was. But that was a critical time for India, and for Englishmen who loved India. It was not that British rule was going to end, it was the manner of its ending, the awful doubt whether Indian unity wouldn't disintegrate with it. The job I was about to undertake couldn't fail to be hard, and it might well be thankless too. Yet, I remember feeling full of optimism. India, 1947, a subcontinent, 400 million people, speaking 23 languages and 200 dialects, living under direct British rule and in more than 500 semi-independent states dating from antiquity. million people, divided by diversity of race and by the existence of 3,000 castes, differing for occupational, territorial, tribal, racial or religious reasons. 250 million of them Hindus. Ninety million Muslims. Six million Sikhs. And in addition, Buddhists and Christians and numberless sects united by the British Raj and the desire for freedom. India, 1967. 20 years ago, it was to be my job to bring the people of India the freedom they desired. I suppose, unconsciously, I had been preparing for this task for the last three years. I had begun to acquire an up-to-date insight into Indian affairs in 1944 as Supreme Commander Southeast Asia. Then, in 1945 and 1946, I found myself face to face with the new tide of Asian nationalism, which of course included India, and I had to work out an attitude towards it. In Burma, in Singapore, and in Malaya, I had adopted the policy of trying to make the nationalists our friends, instead of trying to suppress them. I hoped that people in India would remember this, and that now they would at least give me a chance of attempting the same treatment with Indian nationalism. The issue of Indian independence was brought to a head, as I had seen with my own eyes, by the Second World War. Throughout the whole of my Southeast Asia campaign, the bulk of my forces were always Indian. Indeed, they were the largest single Indian army ever to take the field. Without them, there wouldn't have been a campaign. By the end of the war, two million Indians had joined the services, and the Indian services themselves had been totally transformed. It was a mechanized war times, you might almost have called it a technician's war. Thousands of Indians learned to become technicians. The Indian Air Force and the Indian Navy developed enormously, both of them very technical services. Indian women also played their part, as nurses and in the auxiliary services. All these things helped to transform the traditional attitudes and prepare India for a new independent role 
in the 20th century. India spoke with divided voices. There were Indians who waged war. There were many who opposed the war. The Indian National Congress, the Congress Party, was born in 1885. All through the 20th century, the Congress Party had been the most powerful agent of the independence movement. By 1939, it was not only the largest political party in India, but its opposition to British rule had become absolute. Under the inspiration of Mahatma Gandhi, direct action by Congress had generally been non-violent, but not always. New leaders had emerged. Most prominent among them, Jawaharlal Nehru. Nehru came from a wealthy and talented family. He was educated at Harrow and Cambridge, but he was a man of the left, the idol of the younger members of the Congress party. He preached non-cooperation with the British. In 1939, this meant opposition to the war and non-participation in government. For the unity of India, this was fatal. The Congress party had always been an all Indian party. It was predominantly Hindu because Hinduism was the religion of the largest number of Indians. But a quarter of India's population belonged to the Muslim religion. Congress had claimed to speak for Muslim India too. But in 1940, Congress opposition to the war was matched by Muslim opposition to Congress. Mohammed Ali Jinnah, once a believer in Muslim cooperation with Congress, was now denouncing Hindu domination and Hinduization. The Muslim League, founded in 1906, had detached itself from Congress. Jinnah had become its leader, and now in 1940, he came out with the open demand not only for independence, but also for a separate Muslim state, Pakistan. In 1942, British imperialism in the Far East was rocked by defeat. The Japanese stood at the gates of India. Indian nationalism now perceived an opportunity. Gandhi proclaimed his quit India policy, open rebellion, which might well coincide with a Japanese advance. There were riots and disturbances which cost about a thousand lives. The government acted promptly. Gandhi, Nehru, and the Congress leaders were arrested, along with 60,000 of their followers. This was the situation which Field Marshal Lord Wavell inherited when he became Viceroy in October 1943, the month in which I arrived in Delhi as Supreme Allied Commander Southeast Asia. In 1945, the Congress leaders were released, but the elections of 1945 revealed a new situation. Congress remained India's largest and most powerful party, but it no longer spoke for the Muslims. These now gave their overwhelming support to the Muslim League and Mr. Jinnah. And so the concept of Pakistan steadily became more real. But that inevitably meant partition. Partition was anathema to Congress, dreaded by many non-Congress Indians, and unacceptable to the British, for we boasted that we had given India her first real unity. But there could be no Pakistan without partition. In 1946, Britain's new Labour government made yet another attempt to preserve Indian unity. A cabinet mission was sent out, headed by Lord Pethick Lawrence, who was supported by Mr. A. V. Alexander and Sir Stafford Cripps. Negotiations dragged on in sweltering heat for three months. They appear to have achieved some success, but agreement broke down in the atmosphere of mounting distrust between the Congress party and the Muslim League. With the failure of the cabinet mission plan, India faced civil war. The British Prime Minister, Mr. Attlee, concluded that only a completely fresh approach could avert disaster. Lord Wavell's sincerity and goodwill were not enough. 
There would have to be, said Attlee, a change of bowling. He invited Mountbatten to take on the post of Viceroy. When Mr. Attlee asked me to take on this job, he rather took my breath away. This wasn't something that could be decided straight off. And in fact, we had several meetings about it. I asked to see the king. As king emperor, he kept very close touch with Indian affairs. I pointed out to him that the chances of complete failure were very great. And it would be bad for him to have a member of his family fail. He replied, but think how good it would be for the monarchy if you succeed. And he then asked me formally to accept the appointment. This acceptance marked the beginning of the most intensive period of activity of Mountbatten's whole life. A life always conducted at a high pitch of intensity. He now had to turn himself into an expert on the whole complex Indian political scene. And he had just a month to do it in. Typically, he wasted no time. Work, constant and urgent, began immediately. Meeting people at once became a vital element. And that began in London. Dr. Commissioner, thank you very much indeed for your welcome here. I'm very grateful to you for having given me the opportunity of meeting so many old friends and so many new friends. I knew it wasn't going to be all smiles and handshakes. The possibilities of failure were terribly real. There had been appalling riots in Calcutta back in August 1946 with 5,000 dead and 15,000 injured. These were followed by other horrible massacres in other places. Now, in March 1947, as I was preparing to set out, there was virtual civil war in the Punjab. Faced with such facts as these, the sense of urgency took hold of me at once and never left me. Mountbatten arrived in Delhi on March the 22nd. The occasion was marked by ceremonial dating back through nearly a hundred years of vice-regal pomp. At the top of the long flight of steps, leading up to the Viceroy's house, the Viceroy-to-be was greeted by the Viceroy in office. The formalities denoted that for one more day, Lord Wavell, as the personification of the King Emperor, held the status of a monarch in this house. When Wavell departed next day, it was with the sadness of leaving a great task unfinished, but with the knowledge of having once again done his utmost in the service of his country. On March the 24th, Mountbatten was sworn in. Now, all India's hopes and all her complexities lay in his keeping. It was a very splendid ceremony, very impressive, but very brief. Someone who timed it said it was all over in 15 minutes. It was sobering to think of the responsibility I was assuming in that short space of time. I sat on the throne with Edwina beside me and thought that now I had to guide the destinies of one-fifth of humanity. Coming back now, after 20 years, one might almost suppose that nothing had changed. This great house, built by Lutyens and only completed in 1938, is itself an astonishing memorial of the Raj, the product of British imagination inspired by India. But what I had to do in 1947 was to wind up the Raj, to guide India into independence. I played my part in all the ceremonies, knowing that I would be the last viceroy to do so, 
the last of a long line of British rulers going back to Clive and Warren Hastings. I wondered how to prevent the break with the past when it came from being absolute. Would anything survive of the historic links between Britain and India? Links that went back to the East India Company, then to Imperial India, when my great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, became Queen Empress. Links that have been forged even stronger on the battlefields of two world wars and on many other battlefields besides. Would it all be swept away? The thought appalled me. But one thing was sure. If any of this was to survive, it could only be by the restoration of goodwill, the goodwill of all Indians. And so I became Viceroy. And work started in earnest here in this study, which is now the study of the President of India. I opened the first dispatch box and took out a paper which had been sent to me for an immediate decision. It was a death sentence for murder requiring my confirmation. I read through the case carefully. There was no doubt about it, I'm afraid, so I sadly signed the sentence. The realities had quickly overtaken me. The British government had agreed to give me a time limit. Indian independence was to be achieved by June 1948. That was only 15 months off. 15 months then seemed a very short time for the transfer of imperial power. And the question, the enormous question, to which I had to find an answer as rapidly as possible was, to whom could we transfer our power? Our one desire was to preserve a united India. Could we do it? And if so, who would be its rulers? If the leaders of the Indian communities really couldn't resolve their differences, then there would have to be partition. A hated thought. And how was that to be carried out? The realities had a bleak look in March 1947. Characteristically, Mountbatten had taken certain precautions. He had stipulated to Mr. Attlee that he should, if necessary, be independent of the India office in London. Mr. Attlee was distinctly taken aback. You are asking for plenipotentiary powers. No one has been given those in this century. There was a long silence. And then he said, all right, you have them. It shows his imagination and his largeness of mind that he accepted this too. But it was absolutely essential. I had to be able to make up my mind on the spot. And even more important, it was essential that the Indian leaders should feel that at last their affairs were being decided here in India, not in London. It made all the difference. I had been on Mountbatten's staff at Combined Operations and throughout his time as Supreme Allied Commander, Southeast Asia. Now I was to be one of the small team headed by Lord Ismay that he invited to supplement and support the normal Viceroy's staff for confronting Mountbatten as India's last Viceroy was no normal situation. For really the effective British decision to quit India had been taken all unwittingly when war was declared in 1939 because at that time we ceased recruiting for the Indian Civil Service. Its normal complement, even at the height of the Raj, had never been more than 1,100. By, no by November 1946, it had fallen to 520 British officers in senior posts, and many of these were overdue for retirement, with the remainder Indians, their loyalties strained and divided in trying to administer a regime it would soon be their function to supersede. As for the maintenance of law and order, it was doubtful whether the police establishment was strong enough by 1947 to enforce any policy opposed simultaneously by the two major Indian nationalist parties, the Congress and Muslim League. To have tried to supplement them with major military reinforcements from Great Britain would have been out of the question. Once again, Mountbatten's role was to grip a crumbling situation to give the ship of state in India the sense of being steered again. This he performed, 
His presence was felt from the moment he arrived. Every waking minute of every day, a Mountbatten could manage with very little sleep. The Viceroy was tirelessly at work. The immediate task was to establish contacts with people, the key figures of Indian politics, and through them, with the people of India. Once again, I could see that everything was going to depend upon personal relationships. If I could build up an atmosphere of trust and understanding with the key figures, I might succeed. If I couldn't do that, I knew I hadn't got a hope. And of course, all this had to be done in such a way that none of them could think that the others were being privileged or getting away with backstairs methods. Far and away the most outstanding man in India, a world figure, and although a Hindu, revered by hundreds of millions of his fellow countrymen, Muslims and Hindus alike, was Mahatma Gandhi, known affectionately and reverently to them as Gandhiji. At my first meeting with Gandhi, we didn't talk any business at all. We just chatted. I told him how the Prince of Wales and I had tried to meet him when we were here in 1921 and how we weren't allowed to. He was really interested in that. Then I got him to tell me about his early life, his political beginnings in South Africa, and how he built up the non-violent independence movement. We spent two hours talking in this way, and the press could hardly believe that we hadn't been deciding the fate of India. Well, perhaps we had, indirectly. Gandhi's purely political power was on the way. He was a modern-day saint, really, and saints can't thrive forever in a political atmosphere. It was characteristic of Gandhi that, at our very next meeting, the next day, in fact, he proposed, as a solution to India's problems, that I should ask Jinnah to form an administration. He really meant it, even though he must have realized that this meant giving the Muslims virtual control. Anything rather than see India divided or have a civil war. Of course, it was quite impractical. I told him he must first get the support of the Congress party. And this, he naturally failed to get. But that was Gandhi. We might not always be able to take Gandhi along with us, but we would get nowhere if he came out against us. When he started calling Edwina and me his dear friends, I began to have the feeling that we were halfway home. Nehru was already a friend, of course. My first meeting with him had been almost exactly a year before when he visited Singapore whilst I was still Supreme Commander, Southeast Asia. He knew now that he would get a fair deal from me. With Nehru, the trust I was trying to build up with the leaders was already there, and more than trust, friendship. It was not only between him and me, but with Edwina and my daughters Patricia and Pamela too. He believed that our whole family loved India and would try and do what was right for India. Nehru was a great statesman. He had a brilliant mind. He was quite amazingly quick to grasp a point and very sensitive to situations. I had an early indication of his acuteness. Not long after I arrived, he said to me, have you by some miracle been given plenty of potentiary powers? Why do you ask? You behave quite differently from any other viceroy. One has a feeling that what you say goes. Well, what if I have? In that case, you will succeed, said Nero. Sardar Vallabhai Patel was another tremendously important figure. Inside the Congress party, he was just about as eminent as Nehru. Patel concentrated on internal politics. He was the man who dispensed patronage in the party. As Home Minister, that meant he controlled the jobs. Patel could be really tough. Perhaps he didn't have Nehru's mass appeal, but he could wield great influence. It was he who had done most to end the mutiny in the Indian Navy in February 1946, a very ugly moment. 
Patel could be a great force for moderation, if he so decided. But if he didn't, he could be most dangerous. At one of our very early meetings, Serta Patel and I had a stand-up row. He was used to getting his own way, and on this occasion, I didn't like his manner of going about it. He was astonished, not to say shocked, to find that he had to give way to me, but he did. From then onwards, our relationship improved until in the end, we also became firm friends. Here again, the alternative would have been disastrous. We could never have hoped to make any headway against Patel's opposition. In this case, I owe a lot to the late V.P. Menon, who wrote the history of these events. He was a member of my staff, but he was also very close to Serda Patel, and he did a great deal to smooth the way and help us to understand each other. The man whom I had real difficulty in getting through to was Mr. Jenner, the Kadiazm, the great leader, as his followers called him. If it could be said that any single man held the future of India in the palm of his hand in 1947, that man was Muhammad Ali Jinnah. To all intents and purposes, Jinnah was the Muslim League. And if the dream of Pakistan, the separate Muslim state, ever did come true, it would be Jinnah who brought it to life and fashioned it. I tried the same technique with him as I'd used with Gandhi. No business at the first meeting, just talk to get to know each other. He was very surprised by this, but after a while he softened up a bit and we got on well enough. But I said after that interview, my God, he was cold. Generally speaking, Mountbatten's diplomacy by discussion worked marvelously with the Indian leaders. In the first 44 days after our arrival in March, he had 133 meetings with Gandhi, Jinnah, Nehru, Patel, and the other leaders. Immediately after each interview, he would dictate a brief note of what had been said, which would be available for his staff at the morning moots he had with us. We were all in the picture. This was a good example of his well-tried way of producing in his staff what he called the spirit of the hive. At our staff meetings, all possible concepts were examined. But just how tense and dangerous the situation was is summed up in an entry I made in my diary as early as the 5th of April. Mountbatten has been convinced from the outset that the need for the political solution is much more pressing than was apparent when we were in London and that the June 1948 time limit, far from being not long enough, is already too remote a deadline. He senses the danger of political collapse. Mountbatten had been Viceroy of India for less than a month. Crisis reports flowed in. Bengal and the Punjab were always trouble centers. But now a new one, came into the news, the Northwest Frontier Province. On April the 28th, the Mountbatten's flew to Peshawar. The plan was for quiet, calm deliberation in the governor's residence. But no sooner had the Mountbatten's touched down than they were advised by harassed officials that a vast demonstration and tribal gathering brought together by the Muslim League had been building up over the past week and was within a mile of Peshawar. There seemed no means of stopping them. Mountbatten drove off to the demonstration, Lady Mountbatten with great courage insisting on going with him. The enormous crowd confronting us was certainly formidable and they were gesticulating and waving hundreds of illegal green flags with the white crescent of Pakistan. And there was a steady chant of Pakistan Zindabad. Within a few minutes of our arrival, the tension lifted and the slogan changed to Mountbatten Zindabad. Any sort of speech was out of the question, but the impact of their friendly, confident personalities on that fanatical assembly had to be seen to be believed. As I looked at each day's new results of communal discord, I realized that in their present mood, the religious groups were just not going to be able to live together. They were tearing their country to pieces. What a calamity. And it wasn't as though India had ever lacked calamities. 
flood, pestilence, famine were always to be reckoned with, despite all efforts to avert them. I remembered vividly the great Bengal floods in 1943, the devastation, misery, and loss of life they caused were incalculable. Nature in the East can be a fearful, destructive force. And with the floods, of course, came famine, a terrible famine. I believe the loss of life from flood and famine in 1943 alone was about two millions. It didn't need the efforts of human beings to cause the havoc in India. Yet that was precisely what human beings were doing, by refusing to live in peace together. Well, if they wouldn't live together, then they would have to live apart. This was a realization which had been growing on me almost from the moment I came out here. I could sense a real tragedy just round the corner if we didn't act very fast. Civil war in its worst form. Beside that, partition, much as so many of us hated it, now seemed a much lesser evil. And so, our dream of handing on a united India had vanished. India would have to be divided, and this would have to happen before June 1948. It was Jinnah who, more than any other man, had made partition inevitable. And yet, when it came to practical matters, made the bargaining so difficult that he almost defeated his own ends. The argument over the two key provinces, Bengal and the Punjab, seemed to be insurmountable. He argued there must be partition. Otherwise, as a minority community, the Muslims would be swamped in Hindu India. Right, I said. Then, by the same argument, the two provinces you want in Pakistan, with large non-Muslim minorities, will also have to be partitioned. Oh, no, you can't do that. Punjabi unity and Bengali unity are much more important than Hindu-Muslim differences. In that case, I said, surely Indian unity is much more important than Hindu-Muslim differences. Oh, no, said Jenna, we must have Pakistan. And so it went on. A circular argument, round and round the mulberry bush. I never met anybody who could say no so persistently and so effectively. Perversity was not all on one side. At one stage, Gandhi, the man of peace, even urged that Indian unity should be maintained by force. Yet, a plan had to be produced. And the plan was produced. In just six weeks, six weeks of pure Mampan. On May the 3rd, it was submitted to the British government. I went off for a short rest in Simla. But in fact, the most important single piece of business of all happened there. Nehru was staying with me when the British government's amended version of our plan arrived. I decided to back a hunch. Since Nero was here with me, I would show it to him straight away in confidence. Of course, I could never have thought of such a thing if we hadn't already been such good friends. This is something I couldn't possibly have done except on the basis of a complete mutual trust. Nero turned the new draft down flat. He said it would lead to the balkanization of India and he would have nothing to do with it. And he doubted if any party would. If I hadn't shown it to him, and he and the other leaders had been forced to say that in public, what fools we should all have looked. As it was, there was still a chance. VP Menon was with me in Simla, and he came to the rescue again. We all of us worked at full pressure to find a new formula. By indefatigable industry and inexhaustible tact, Mountbatten won the agreement of the Indian leaders to a new plan, the plan. On June the 3rd, at a historic and dramatic meeting, this agreement was put to the test. Right up to the last moment, there remained the chance that another clash of personality might wreck everything. But Mountbatten's grip did not falter. 
he firmly steered the Indian leaders towards acceptance of the plan, and with it, acceptance of the responsibilities of power. On the same day, Mr. Attlee announced the plan in the House of Commons. The applause which greeted Mountbatten's solution to India's problem gave no hint of the sharp criticism which was to come. Our plan amounted to this. There were to be two independent dominions remaining within the Commonwealth, thank goodness. India, predominantly Hindu in the middle, and because the Muslims were concentrated in two widely separated areas, a divided Pakistan, west and east. Jinnah wanted a corridor between the two parts, but we talked him out of that. The princely states, over 500 of them all told, would in theory become independent, but I urged them to accede to one or other of the two new dominions. All governmental assets, including the armed forces, the civil service and the police, would be divided between them. In disputed areas, a boundary commission would draw the actual frontiers. It was predictable that there would be areas which would be bitterly disputed, and there was bound to be trouble. But we had to have a plan and act on it. The only alternative was chaos. It was of the utmost importance for the Indian and international press to be persuaded that after all the years of frustration and near misses, an agreement of substance and reality had at last been achieved. Political speculation was the lifeblood of the Indian journalist. They needed persuading. Mountbatten faced and surmounted this situation with what was perhaps the most powerful exposition of his career, his famous press conference for 300 journalists on June the 4th. He spoke without notes, expounding for about three quarters of an hour a political plan of the utmost complexity, both in its detail and implication. It was a speech which must have cleared many lurking doubts among that audience of professional skeptics about the plan's substance and purpose. And then an extraordinary thing occurred. In a reply to a question, Mountbatten made the first reference to bringing forward the transfer of power to the 15th of August. Such was the atmosphere at this astonishing press conference that nobody took time off to reason why or to question this statement. It just seemed to follow naturally. The August deadline was really dictated to me by my whole experience since I had arrived in India, and above all, by the virtual breakdown of normal government. The Viceroy's Executive Council contained nine members who always voted on the Congress side, and six Muslim League members. With partition nine sight, they pulled in completely opposite directions, and it was no use bringing disputed points to the vote, because the Congress always won, nine to six. So the Executive Council, in effect, broke down. I tried the expedient of setting up two shadow cabinets, one for each future dominion, but even this eventually broke down. Direct rule I considered impossible. The British administration was no longer capable of carrying it out, and in any case it was a thoroughly bad solution. The Indian leaders had opted for partition. They must be the ones to carry it out, and not the British. Uh, looking back to 1947, uh, one is apt to miss uh, the intensity and the bitterness that existed in India at that time. And uh, yet, in spite of what uh, one has seen during these last 20 years, I have no hesitation in saying that the decision when it was taken was a perfectly genuine one and one which the leaders of India thought was in the best interests of the future of the country. There remained one section of the Indian population to be persuaded to accept the Mountbatten plan, the princes. Maharajas, Rajas, Nawabs, Khans, and petty rulers over more than 500 kingdoms, principalities, and dependencies. 
Some of these princes were important potentates with their own armies of varying size and efficiency. In both world wars, contingents from these states had served beside the British and Indian armies, sharing their defeats and victories. The lands from which they came sometimes covered large areas. Other states were no bigger than a fort, a town or a parish. The degrees of independent rule which the princes enjoyed under the British Raj were various, but each of them was indeed a prince, with a stake in India handed down through centuries. The princes of India were in a pathetic situation. They belonged to the past, a remote past, and most of them had no idea of how to conduct themselves towards the people who are going to be India's new rulers. They were disunited, proud, frightened, some of them angry and all of them uncertain. At my first official reception, one of them was described as wandering around like a letter without a stamp. As the King Emperor's personal representative, I had a special duty towards them all, for they were all in treaty relations with His Imperial Majesty. Fortunately, I knew a number of them well. Some of them had been friends since 1921, when they had been ADCs with me to the Prince of Wales. I saw the principal rulers separately. Then, I summoned a full-scale meeting of the Chamber of Princes. I told them I wanted to make the best bargain for them that I could, but that after the 15th of August, I wouldn't be in a position to mediate for them anymore. So they must make up their minds now. I warned them solemnly against any thought of resorting to arms. I told them they couldn't run away from the new Dominion governments that were going to be their neighbors. They would have to live with them. I remember the tension in the house was very stiff. Some of the princes who couldn't make up their minds and others who were away were represented by their prime ministers. One prime minister got up and asked Lord Louis what he should do as his master is away on high seas. Lord Louis paused a little, picked up this crystal paperweight, looked at it and said, yes, I see the Maharaja. He's having coffee with the captain. He says, sign the agreement and put it down. At this point, there was a complete silence in the house. But this act of Lord Louis eased the tension and helped the princes to make up their minds in signing of the instrument of accession. With independence now in sight, the pace of work for all concerned, already exhausting, became even swifter. The date which Mountbatten had mentioned so seemingly casually, August the 15th, 1947, now became a target. We had started with a time limit of 15 months. We had ended with one of 20 weeks. We had no precedence to go on. In spite of the dangers ahead, there was a sense of exhilaration induced by the political agreement, which gave Mountbatten and his staff added strength to cope with the host of administrative problems crowding in on us during those hectic weeks and days before August the 15th. There was also a sense of urgency, which Mountbatten did his utmost to stimulate in all around him. He had a special calendar prepared for his staff, which stated starkly under the date, so many days to the transfer of power. As a reminder to us to keep busy and to do our duty, it wasn't strictly necessary. But it somehow symbolized his will to succeed and, having broken the historical deadlock in India, to keep things moving. History was on the march again. He wanted to be sure that we kept up with it. Everything seemed to be happening at once and so fast that by a paradox, time itself seemed to come to a standstill. August 13th, 1947. Only two days remained before Indians achieved their independence. But by the nature of the plan accepted, independence would mean two things, 
and the focus of attention would be in two places. For this was going to mean an independent India and an independent Pakistan. So on August the 13th, the Viceroy was not in Delhi, but in Karachi. It was a great day for the Muslim League, and a great day for Mr. Jinnah, whose dreams had now come true. Now, he not only had an independent Muslim dominion, but he himself was about to be installed as the first Governor General of Pakistan. It was disconcerting, to say the least, to be aware all through the ceremonies in Karachi that there was a plot to throw a bomb at Jinnah as he drove back from the swearing-in. In fact, I tried to dissuade him from going through with the state drive, but he'd insisted on doing it. So I said I would accompany him. He then tried very hard to dissuade me, and it was my turn to insist. Anyway, there we both were, trying to look cheerful, as the vast crowds cheered us and cried out, Zindabad! Knowing all the time that somewhere among them there was at least one man with a bomb. For some reason he didn't throw it, so he got back to Government House safely. And Jinnah, in a moment of rare emotion, laid his hand on my knee and said, Thank God I've brought you back alive. I thought this was a bit much, so I replied, Thank God I've brought you back alive. Delhi, August the 14th, 1947. Pandit Nehru addressed the Indian Constituent Assembly. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history, when we step out from the old to the new, when an age ends, and when the soul of a nation, long suppressed, finds utterance. Mission accomplished. It wasn't exactly the mission I'd come out to perform. I'd come out to see if there was a last chance of handing over to a united India. It turned out that there wasn't even a remote chance. We'd had to accept that. But it was a sad reflection. So I couldn't look on this day's achievement with completely undiluted pleasure. And then, too, there was a sense of the end of an epoch. 200 years of British rule in India with all the tremendous memories that that implied. This very building shouts empire at you from every angle. You couldn't get away from it. But all through this whole business, I've been trying to think of the future more than the past. I've been Viceroy for less than five months. But it seemed like five years, or perhaps like five minutes. On the day I was installed, I said to Nero, I want you to regard me not as the last Viceroy winding up the British Raj, but as the first to lead the way to a new India. So now, now that it had all happened, that was the way I mostly felt about it. It wasn't an end, it was a beginning, an unbelievably happy beginning. 